sensational chart. Uh, we go through the chart, of course, at least six times every year just to keep it fresh in our minds. The children learn the chart in the back, and so they're out here with us because uh, the material will be familiar to them. Uh, them having studied it, and there's giant pictures on the wall in the back that they go through and study in detail each aspect as well. It's important to have an image of the chart in your mind. Um, I printed one so that, you know, when your mind gets senile and you can't remember, it's right here. Um, it helps you understand the events in the Bible when they happen and how they relate to each other. The Bible is not just a collection of stories just randomly put together. Uh, there are 66 different books written at different times, in fact, over the span of 1,400 years by four, over 40 different authors, as you've heard by so many other uh, teachers and apologists. And so it is over the course of history, and yet there is a chronology to it. Okay? And so you can't open the Bible on any page in the Bible, just pluck out something that you're to participate in. And so when people have the Bible, it's a little intimidating. They don't know where to start. They start from page one, which means they don't get to understand the gospel until they get halfway through the year or further. Because Paul's gospel is later in the book. Okay? And so w when you're talking to someone about how to study their Bible, or people are confused about their Bible, uh, explain to them God's dispensations or giving them a picture of God's dispensations and revelations will help them know how to use their own Bible, okay? And that's the purpose of dispensational Bible study. In your chart, there are two panels, uh, the back panel, one in the middle, that explain just simply how to rightly divide, how to uh, discern the times, and how to know instructions given to you. Because these are all important things for you to understand when you read your Bible. We need to understand, like I just mentioned, that God gives revelations throughout the Bible. So it's not that on page one, God had already revealed what everybody should do. Neither is it that today we look back and everything in it we should do. Okay? God gave progressive revelation through time. And we need to understand when did he give the revelation? To whom did he give it? How did it change our understanding of God's will? And how does it change how we respond to his will? These are all important questions to ask when we study the Bible. There are times where God reveals something. And then later, as humanity matures, as we get to understand what he's already revealed, he reveals something else. And it changes the way we, res we respond. And so we've dealt before with the example of, uh, it's like children, where you may tell your children not to cross the road unless they're with an adult. But when they grow up, you don't tell your adult children this. Why? You know, because things have changed, right? And so there's different instructions. It's the same with their Bible. And so the, the, the scripture describes this method of Bible study as rightly dividing the word of truth, meaning we need to pay attention to what God has revealed to whom and make clear divisions between them, lest we get confused and think we're to do everything the Bible says, which would be a, a wrong thing. Okay, One person told me once that uh, I do everything the Bible says, and which told me he really didn't uh, study every, every verse in the Bible completely because there's things you can't do everything in the Bible. Uh, in Jesus' own ministry, he tells the disciples at one time uh, to take no script, take no sword. And another time he tells them to take a script, you know, take some money, take a sword. So Jesus himself changes his instructions in his own ministry. So it's just common sense. We need to understand at what time God reveals the instructions to whom he's talking and whether we're, we're part of it. Uh, as we draw the chart this morning, and as you open up the chart, uh, you'll notice the bottom of the chart are the books of the Bible. And the books of the Bible... Uh, are not necessarily in direct chronological order. There are some books in the Bible that are written before that come after in the order in your Bible. And yet, as a whole, generally speaking, uh, you can open your Bible and find where in history God is speaking. The earlier books are typically in the front of your Bible, and as you go through more, it, it goes through history, revealing more and more. Okay, so there's some things we need to, to watch out for, but generally that's true. And so at the bottom of your, your, your chart, you can explain to people, when we go back to Genesis through Malachi and the prophets, it's dealing with these topics right here, and it's explaining about things that happened in the past. The same as Matthew through Acts. These are things that happened in the past. Okay? As we progress and, and get to Paul's revelation, Romans through Philemon is where that's contained. We learn that came after Jesus' ministry, came after the cross, and when we read the books of Hebrews through Revelation, we learn that it's talking about things that have yet to happen to Israel on the earth. We discussed some of that this morning in Revelation chapter 11. And so we need to understand, and when you explain to people the chart, that there is a chronology to your Bible. There is a timeline. Okay? The tendency for people, like I said before, is to come to the Bible and think it's just one giant manual so that everything in it is for us right now. When actually there's a timeline to it, a chronology. So it's a history of God's revelations and dispensations, which is why we need to rightly divide it. Okay? We need to understand who is speaking to whom and understand that those who have later prophecies and revelations, uh, you know, didn't necessarily have to do everything God said before, and those who came before didn't even know about the things that God will reveal later. Okay, 
And that's the, the intent of going through a chart like this. Timing is important, okay? We need to know our instructions, whether God is speaking to Israel, whether God is speaking to the church, the back panel that deals with that. You know, it would be wrong for us to try to do something that God told specifically someone else to do and them only to do, right? Sometimes God speaks generally or speaks to people in general uh, generalities. There's sometimes God says, you do that. God told Noah to build the ark, not you, right? And so we need to know who is he speaking to. There's times that God says things exclusively to Israel. And we'll cover that a little bit later. And so we as the church would not do that. And yet you, you would be surprised how many times uh, the church is taught today that we need to do everything in the Bible, even those things God told to do Israel. Um, most recent examples are studying Malachi 3, where God told Israel to tithe. And pastors today everywhere tell them to tithe because God told Israel to tithe. Well, that doesn't mean he told you to tithe. And so we need to, to understand who is speaking and to whom. This chart is designed to help us understand that as well. Okay, And so when you're explaining a dispensational <coughs> charter or, or walking through this handout with people, you need to always begin with the gospel. You can either have a conversation with them or you don't have time for the conversation. At least state the gospel to them and let them know this is where we begin. Because studying the Bible will be pointless to someone who's not saved. It will be pointless to someone when they don't know the gospel. In fact, it will be really hard to understand how to rightly divide when they don't know where the gospel is that saves them. If they think the gospel is keeping the Sabbath day, they won't get as far as you know, Genesis or Exodus and think that's where I'm at right there. But if they understand the gospel is the preaching of Jesus Christ, that he died on the cross for your sins, and that your sins require an atonement, Christ was that atonement. He died for our sins so that we can be forgiven and we have eternal life only because Jesus Christ resurrected and because we're made just through his resurrection. Right? And so Romans 4.25, it's through, he was raised again for our justification. There's the gospel that we trust and believe that gives us salvation. When we understand that at the beginning, then we can start to unveil what God has revealed through the Bible over time. You can even point to someone and explain that that gospel, which we just talked about, is found in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. Right? It says very clearly the gospel by which you are saved is that Christ died for your sins according to the scriptures and was raised again the third day according to the scriptures. Okay? And so that's a good place to start is with people being saved. Once you reveal the gospel and explain that gospel to people you need to open up the chart and explain to people that your bible is not a static revelation it's not something that plopped out of the air yesterday it's something that has been being been built throughout history and is progressive and has a timeline okay so the left side of our chart the left side of our board this morning will represent before the world began or when the world began in the case of genesis 1 verse 1 in the beginning god created the heaven and the earth and the right side of our board, the far right side of your chart, uh, will be the ends of the world or the future. You'd be amazed at, at, at the things that people just don't think about. They never considered that before, but it's true. Okay, The right side of your Bible, the right side of our chart, will be the ends of the world. The left side of your chart will be the beginning, will be the things that God revealed earlier. Okay, And so we start with Genesis 1.1, and we learn that God created the heaven and the earth. You see on your chart, there's a connecting line between the earth and then there's a cloud up there representing heaven. And so God created the heaven and the earth, the very first verse of the Bible. Yet there's something more to that than you may think. As you read down through Genesis 1, and it's really not until later in the chapter that God created the, fir the firmament of heaven and the ground of the earth. But in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. What does this mean? Colossians chapter 1, verse 16, God told Paul that there's invisible things, thrones, dominions, principalities, and powers that exist in heaven and earth. God created these authorities, these jurisdictions, these powers before he created one man. He created the throne first and then put man on it. Okay, And so he created these authorities in heaven and earth, these invisible things, and then he spoke into existence the things that are, okay, the things that are created. This is important because we talk about the earth, we need to understand that it's also a heavenly dominion up here that God has a purpose for. His, God's going to be dealing with dominion on the heaven in the heavens and the earth. He wants to rule over the universe that he created. Okay? Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. And so, uh, in Genesis chapter 2, we read about the creation of Adam, the first man, and Eve, the first woman. And he told Adam and Eve to be fruitful and multiply and have dominion on the earth. The chart, of course, will have the verse references for you in case you forget. Genesis 1, 28, 29 is where he tells Adam and Eve to have dominion on the earth. They were God's representatives on the earth to have dominion. Okay? Um, we also learn, when he says to have dominion on the earth, that God has an end goal. 
right? Having dominion on the earth wasn't something that happened immediately. Adam and Eve had the position to have dominion and rule, but he told Adam to, to, to have dominion, to, be, to subdue the earth, right? So make it yours, right? Make it under the dominion of, of God. And so we learn from the very beginning before sin even fell that God has an end goal in mind. He wants to set up a dominion, a throne over the earth. And this is a pretty poor representation. That's why I printed it out for you. Um, of, of God's dominion over the earthly sphere. Okay? Um, God has an end goal. God has a future plan for the earth. Uh, we'll learn later about his future plan for heaven. Of course, in Genesis chapter 3, sin entered the earth. And as they say, it wasn't the fruit on the tree, the apple on the tree. It was the pear on the, on the ground, right? And so they sinned, brought death into the world. And by that death, now things have changed. God's goal to have dominion on the earth through these people are now tainted because these people are sinners. And these people don't deserve to rule on the earth. And so God now has to solve this problem. Okay? He, so the Bible is actually God's revelation of his purpose for heaven and earth to bring salvation and restoration to the earth. You see on your, your chart here, if you open to the third panel, it says the times of restitution right above that kingdom right there. Okay? Ever since the fall, God has his purpose to restore on the earth what he made the earth for, which was his dominion. Okay, this is going to be important. As we read through the Bible, God's going to unveil how he's going to accomplish that. How he's going to restore dominion on the earth that he first gave to Adam. He's going to do that through his chosen people, through his Messiah, through his kingdom and his chosen nation. Right? And we'll see that coming up. And so we see God's future plan. Uh, the, 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 first, the first problem in the Bible there is sin. And he promises in Genesis 3 that there will be a solution to it. Genesis 3.15, he says through the seed of the woman there, he'll uh, bruise the head of Satan. And he will have dominion on the earth. He will restore all things. And so this is, this is uh, where we find ourselves in Genesis, the beginning of things. We move on through our Bible in Genesis, and we learn that now God is going to teach humanity something about how he's going to bring restoration, how he's going to bring salvation to the earth. And we find that God calls out a man. In fact, there's some 1,000 years before uh, Abraham where God's dealing with the earth, trying to see whether or not they can, by their own, come to him. And he finds out they can't. They're a failure. He floods the whole world at one point. He, he gives them opportunity after the flood to have dominion on the earth again. And they build a tower and a false religion. And so he confuses their language. And yet, it, so at that point, he says, I've got to do it myself. And so God intervenes and he calls out Abram. He calls out one man and said, I'm going to give you a promise. I'm going to get it done because you can't do it. That's the lesson we learn from Genesis up to Abraham. Man couldn't do it. They failed. That's why the flood came. And so God called Abraham out, and we're going to draw our first intervention, our first revelation here of how we learn of God doing something for this earth. And on your chart has Abraham, uh, Isaac, and uh, Jacob, which are the fathers that God made these promises to, Isaac being the son of Abraham, Jacob being the son of, of Isaac, where he gave promises. In Genesis chapter 12, God promised these people that they would be uh, a, a people, a mighty people, a mighty nation. They would have a, a land to live in. Right? And they would be a blessing to all the nations of the world. And so again, God wants to have dominion, and he says, man can't do it on their own, so I'm going to do it. And he creates from this one man a nation. He says, this nation will bring blessing to the rest of the world. This nation, of course, will live in a land, so I'll give you a land, and your nation will be great. It'll be a great nation, because I'll be your God. You'll be the mediator. God set up this separation. And so later in Abraham's life, he gives him a covenant of circumcision, which further separates him and sanctifies him different from the Gentile nations. Okay, Gen I say Gentile nations, that's really redundant because Gentile, the word, means nations. On your chart, you'll see this on, on the bottom here, this green bar, which is a separation from the red or the brown, which is God's chosen sanctified people. Uh, these people down below are Gentiles or the rest of the nations that God called Abraham out of. He said, Abraham, come out from those people. Come out from them. I'm going to sanctify you. That word sanctify just means make separate. To separate for God's purpose. That's what we see happening with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He separates them and gives them his purpose. Now, that means that this purpose of God that he revealed through Abraham will be fulfilled in the future. We, so we draw a little timeline. We can, we can follow each one of these steps all the way to God's fulfilled purpose. And you see on the right side of your chart there that those promises given to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob will be fulfilled with a nation in a, in a land that will be a blessing uh, to the nations of the world. Okay, I've got the land, seed, and blessing over here. 
Moving on in the Bible, we read that as we progress through history, that God, again, after Israel becomes mu multitude in number, he, he creates a savior within Israel. And uh, this man's name was Moses. And of course, you read in Exodus about uh, God using Moses with the plagues and everything to deliver them out of bondage from Egypt. And he gives to Moses a covenant, another one. He gave a covenant to Abraham. He's adding another covenant to Moses, which we know to be the covenant of the law. Okay, and so on your chart there, I've got the little Ten Commandment tablets next to Moses. And God said to Israel, if you obey my laws, then I will bless you with abundant things like rain and, and pomegranates and things like that. He's going to bless them and they'll fulfill God's will if they do this law. Now, you should be kind of considering, well, you know, why did God make a promise first and then the law? Well, this is going to be a mystery that we'll understand a little bit later. But God made this law. They had to do it. He added a condition. If you keep my law, then I will bless you. If you don't, then I will curse you. You see, God had things to teach us. God didn't reveal everything in the Bible to Abraham. He didn't know about the law. Abraham was dead long before the law was given. But God had things to teach us. So as the Bible is written progressively through history, now we're learning something about God's righteousness according to the law. And we should be learning that we don't meet it, right? The law is such a high standard. And you go back there and read the 613 points. Israel should have learned that there's no way we can keep this. In fact, contained in the law itself was provision for sacrifice when they broke the law. Imagine that. Uh, God was really an optimist when he gave the law. He said, here's the law, and when you break it, here's your sacrifices. Okay, Which tells you he didn't anticipate their keeping it perfectly. It was to teach them something. Just like now we can look back and learn things from it, but it doesn't necessarily mean that we're under it and, and participate, participate in all 613 points of it. Okay, So now we learn that the audience becomes important. We learn that now, unless you're of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, unless you're Israel, who alone agreed to keep that law covenant, there was no other nation that God gave that law to. In fact, Deuteronomy 7, God said, I chose you not to be like those other nations. David writes in the Psalms, there's no other nation God has dealt with than Israel like this, right? And so God gave the law to Israel. So when we read the Bible, we need to ask now, who is God speaking to when we read Psalms, when we read you know, Malachi, whomever? Who is he speaking to? Because if he's speaking to his covenant and sanctified people, that may not be you, because you are a Gentile, right? You're someone from another nation. The audience becomes important now in our Bible study. We can't just take anything in the Bible and say, yep, that's us. Right? God, the Bible is not God's love letter to you. Okay? It's God, the revelation of God's uh, intervention in humanity, his revelations, his dispensations, if you will, which is what God dispenses to us. And uh, the more he reveals, the more it changes our understanding of his will and how we're supposed to respond to it. Okay, so moving on here. The law makes that difference that God set up with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It, it makes that difference concrete. Can we say he sets that difference in stone, the stone of the Ten Commandments? He writes it down and says, you will be different. The law commands it, right? That's what he did with that. He made a difference between the Gentiles and Israel. Okay. Now, next on our, our chart, we have a little step here where later in Israel's history, they built their temple, they entered a land, and uh, they, they tried to uh, keep the law. Of course, they failed miserably, but God was still their God, and he, and he gave them mercy. Uh, he sets up a king, which is another progressive element of God's purpose to restore dominion over the earth. Because we're going to have a king over this nation. It's not just the nation. There's going to be a ruler of this nation which, of course, we now know to be fulfilled in the Messiah, but they didn't know that yet. And so God gave them a promise to David of a king and a kingdom. That's the first time they learned that God will promise a king over this country. All right. Before that, if you read the book of Judges, they weren't supposed to have a king. They weren't supposed to have God as their king. Right? But when David comes, now there's a promised king, and God promised David that there will, there will always be someone sitting on your throne forever. Right? When I restore the heaven, the, the earth, there will be a king from your seed, David. So not only is he singled out Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and through Israel, but through David's seed, the son of David, there will be a king ruling over his dominating nation. Okay, And so that's what we see with David. Now, as we move on through the scripture, after David reigns, that's really the height of Israel's history. David's, David and Solomon's reign there, Solomon being David's son. Because after that, you find Israel uh, just going downhill. 
Okay, they continue to break the law. We've got a split, a civil war in Israel. So we've got different tribes doing different things. We've got the law being distorted, traditions being added, and this sort of thing. And so God sends prophets, his messengers, throughout Israel's history to warn them, to correct them, to slap them, and to get them back on track to what they're supposed to be doing. After all, this was God's sanctified nation who was going to have God's king to have a dominion over the earth. Right? And so prophets came, and they taught the message uh, of warning and repentance which is a change of mind, or they would face the consequences of the contract that they agreed to under the law, which was death, okay, for a lot of things, which was uh, punishment, okay? So you have prophets uh, teaching this and communicating this to Israel. And so as they go throughout history, we eventually get to the book of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Okay, the prophets end with the book of Malachi, which is the last prophetic book in your Bible, and the last prophet to speak for some 400 years before John the Baptist comes. Now here, when you're explaining this sensational chart, you need to pause and explain that just because it got to that part of your Bible where there's a separate page that says New Testament doesn't mean there's an actual New Testament there. Like the chapter numbers and the, and the page numbers and the, the titles of your chapters, that page is not inspired by God. Okay, The text is inspired by God. The words in your Bible, those were added for helpful Bible study. Unfortunately, that New Testament page doesn't help anybody. Hebrews chapter 9 says the testament cannot start until the death of a testator, and Jesus does not die until the end of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Right? Of course, everyone understands this, right? No, nobody understands this. But anyway, they put that page in there to try to distinguish the Greek writings from the Hebrew writings in your Bible. But really what's going on in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is just a continuation of what has been spoken since the world began. And so we get to a point here on our chart well, here comes John the Baptist. I'm going to put John, and I'm going to put Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John as an annotation here. Because here's, here's a change in your Bible. This is where a lot of people open their Bible and say, well, it's a big book, kind of confusing. I'm not going to read the Old Testament, this part. I'll just read this part. This is the New Testament. This is all for me, right? The, the new stuff, latest stuff. But we've already seen, if you just read the stuff over here, you won't understand where it came from. We need to understand all of God's revelation. Paul says all scripture is profitable. We need to understand who he was speaking and to whom and where we fit. It takes more than just saying, oh, New Testament is for me, Old Testament's not. Uh, we, we started this morning, we've been studying through Malachi and Obadiah verse by verse, and we've seen the connections with Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John to the, to the prophets, to, to the law, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to God's purpose to have dominion on the earth. And so what, what's happening in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is a fulfillment, a continuation of God's purpose from the beginning. Okay, there's no difference. And so it would be a lot less confusing. It will help us understand the Bible when we know where those came from. Okay, why does Matthew 1.1 1, 1 begin with the, uh, with the promise here, with the book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham? Is this just the county clerk just recording his lineage? Or does that mean something, that Jesus Christ was the son of David, the son of Abraham? You see, now we can understand that that meant something. Son of David, that means he's a candidate to be the king, right? Son of Abraham, that means he's part of God's sanctified nation, which again makes him candidate to be the king, right? Recipient of the promises. So Matthew, there's, there's meaning to these, these books that have to do with prophecy. Things spoken of already have to do with God's dominion on the earth, okay? John the Baptist comes, he preaches the coming uh, wrath, which I don't have on your, your board up here, it's on your chart, where God had promised by the prophets if they did not keep the law, there would be wrath coming up. This is fire. It's on your printed chart there. No doubt you'll understand it more on the chart in front of you. Uh, so there's wrath there. Before the kingdom come, they would face this unless they repented, unless they got salvation, unless they were delivered and, and followed the, the narrow way. Okay? And so this is what John the Baptist came preaching. He tells those who are wicked in Israel, who have warned you to flee the wrath to come. He says, show your fruits. Then I'll get you water baptized, right? But to those who received John the Baptist, those who believed him, those who received Jesus Christ, were water baptized, cleansed of their sins, and were prepared to walk that way into the kingdom, that straight and narrow way Jesus talked about. Okay, wide is the road to destruction, narrow is the way uh, to salvation, as Jesus taught in his earthly ministry. Of course, we have another step here where after John, his cousin Jesus comes, who we've already seen as the son of David, the son of Abraham, and yet we need to understand something important about Jesus is that when he came, he did not come to the Gentiles, okay? He came to Israel. 
In John chapter 1, verse 11, says Jesus came to his own, his own people. Right? He didn't come to Gentiles. They're way down here. In fact, Gentiles are far away from God. Okay? They don't have any promises. They don't have any covenants. They didn't have any promise of a king. They weren't sent any prophets. They're way down here. They're, they're ignorant of God's revelations. And if they wanted to know what God was doing, they had to come through Israel to get that. Which, by the way, seems the way God intended it. Through Israel, all the nations would be blessed. Right? And so we have that, that Gentile line far away from God on your, on your outline there. Jesus came to Israel. Matthew 15, Jesus tells the Canaanite woman, a Gentile, I can't speak to you. I can't give you blessings because they're only given to the children. Israel, you're a dog, is what he calls the Canaanite woman. Why do you call her a dog? Because he's a Gentile. She's far away from God. Of course, that Gentile even had faith and wanted to be blessed by God's chosen nation and confessed. She said, yes, Lord, it's true, but even I can get some blessing if I bless you, if I bless Israel. And that's why Jesus gave her a healing. But in Matthew chapter 10, Jesus told his 12 disciples to not go to the Gentiles. Matthew 10, verse 5, Jesus says, go to Israel, go to Jerusalem, go to Samaria, but don't go to the Gentiles. There was a purpose for that. Israel needed to be built up first before they could minister to the Gentiles. This was God's purpose and his plan for restoration of the earth. Of course, Jesus came and he taught uh, the kingdom. He taught the kingdom was at hand. He taught the same thing the prophets taught. He taught the law. Matthew 5, verse 17. He said, I did not come to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. And so he taught these things. And yet, just like John the Baptist before him, they killed him. Okay? Jesus came and he taught, I'm the Messiah. He said, John the Baptist is preparing the way for me. I'm the son of David. I'm the fulfillment of the promise. I'm your king. And John the Baptist taught the same thing. They cut his head off. Jesus said that they nailed him to a cross. And so Israel's not helping anybody restore God's dominion on the earth. Okay? And yet there are a few that do believe in his name. You hear people today, and uh, just the other day I heard it from a Christian minister, and he said the, the central focus of Christianity is who is Jesus? This is the question. And if people answer this correctly, they can be saved. Well, really, this is not the question that saves you today, even though it's an important question. That's the question of Jesus' earthly ministry. When he came to Israel, that's the question he asked Israel. Who am I? And if they answered, you're the promised son of David, you're the promised son of Abraham, you're our king, bingo. Okay, But what did they know? Let's just recall 20 minutes ago. What did they know about the death and resurrection of Jesus? What did they know about the, the preaching, the good news that saves and atones for your sins? They didn't know about that. They knew about him being the king over Israel, him being the one that would lead them. But they did not know about the death and resurrection. If you look at Matthew chapter 16, we will come here and we'll see a pretty good illustration, of, not illustration, but an example of this. Where in Matthew 16... Jesus asks his disciples, this is towards the middle of his ministry, and he says, let's take stock here, let's take evaluation. And he asks his disciples, who do people say that I am? Which, which is the question of his earthly ministry. He's trying to, to convince people, persuade people that he is the fulfillment of the prophecies. Okay, he's trying to show them that I am the son of God, I am the promised son of man. And of course, the, the disciples respond uh, and say, well, they don't get it right, Lord. They say, some, you, some say you're John the Baptist, some say you're Elijah. Uh, some say you're Jeremiah. Uh, some say you're just a prophet, you know, like George Bush. You know, he was a great prophet. That's something. Uh, well, in verse 16, Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. That's what Peter's answer is. And Jesus says, You're blessed. You're right. I am the Son of God, and I'm here to bring the kingdom to Israel. Okay? And so he gives Peter the keys to the kingdom. And in verse 20, he begins his evangelism ministry when he says, Don't tell any man that I'm Jesus the Christ which is a really bad way to start your ministry. Um, really, Jesus was ending his ministry. He was not starting. Jesus had been preaching he was the Christ for nearly a few years. Okay? When they didn't receive him, now he says, I'm going to a cross. I'm going to kill me, and that's what they're going to do. Which, by the way, he'll later explain, that's what the prophet said would happen anyway, that I would die. Okay? But verse 21, it says, From that time forth began Jesus to show his disciples how that he must go into Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised in the third day. This is the first time you read about in Jesus' earthly ministry of him dying and resurrecting. The first time. And he says it to his disciples. He says it in private. He says it after he tells them, don't tell anyone I'm the Christ. And in verse 22, they didn't understand what he was talking about. 
Okay, he's not preaching it for salvation. He's stating a fact: I'm going to die, and I'm going to come back again. Right? He, if he was a king of Israel, he better come back again. Right? Otherwise, there's no kingdom. Matthew 16, 22, Peter took him and rebuked him and said, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. You are wrong. You got it wrong, son of God. <laughs> Mistake. Right? Matthew 16, 21. Uh, Peter was ignorant of the preaching of the cross that you now know to save you. Luke 18, 34 says a similar thing, where Jesus told his disciples, I'm going to go suffer and die, and I'm going to resurrect. And it says his disciples did not understand what he said. Mark 9, 32 says they were afraid to ask him. They were scared to ask him about his death because they thought they would get rebuked like Peter when Jesus told Peter, get behind me, Satan, because he said, you're not going to do this. <laughs> they didn't understand the gospel that we now believe for our salvation and that we now know and understand. This is important because as we said at the beginning, we need to know what God has instructed, when he revealed it, what they knew, what they didn't know. And so far, we haven't gotten to the point where God has revealed why he died on that cross. And he hasn't got to the point where God has sent that message of the cross to Gentiles. That hasn't happened yet. So far, God's dealing only with Israel, according to his prophecies, about a king. And so what do they know about this guy needing to die? All they know is they need a king. We need that kingdom. We need to have dominion. Right? That's why they're trying to prevent the cross. Okay? So it's important, especially in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, what people call the New Testament scriptures, to rightly divide what people knew. Who was God speaking to? When did they know it? Because you're dealing with a very short timeline here. Unlike the Old Testament, where this is thousands of years, here, this is a matter of years, right? Who knew what? When did God reveal that? Matthew 16, 21 says, From that time forth began Jesus. That's a time element. That'll help you discern the times. Where we know from, the, Jesus did not utter that before Matthew 16, 21, right? So Matthew 5, the preaching of the Sermon on the Mount, as so many Christians like to use a constitution of their church, which is really the constitution of the kingdom, that he wasn't preaching the cross. They didn't know about the cross. They didn't know about salvation by grace through faith. He didn't begin to even speak it, that, uh, except in Matthew 16, 21, and that first to his disciples in private. And that, even then, was not the gospel, the good news of it. That's bad news. They're going to kill me, is what he says. Okay? So moving on. So we have Jesus, who was the king and the Messiah, teaching belief on his name, and yet we see the nation reject him. They kill him. And so on your chart is a cross. And we'll draw up here the... Uh, the cross and the empty tomb, of course, because as Jesus prophesied, he did resurrect the third day uh, from his death. And so we have that cross there, this event that uh, the disciples knew nothing about. In fact, after Jesus died, in those three days, they were moping around like, it's game over. The kingdom's not coming. And Jesus had to resurrect and show them from the law and the prophets that he needed to die. Okay? In fact, if anything, according to this covenant of the law, he needed to die for a New Testament. Is that right? The law, if you go back and study Deuteronomy, the Old Testament had within it a promise of a better testament. This is how much Israel did not read the law. This is how much people today don't read the Bible. The Old Testament had in it a promise that I'm going to get rid of this one and replace it with a new one. It said, when you fail to do this law, I will remember my promise and give you a better one. Jeremiah 31, the prophet said that he'll give you a better testament. Right? They should have known this was going to happen. They should have known that they needed the blood shed for that New Testament, and this guy was going to shed it. Right? But they were totally ignorant of this. They didn't know. Jesus explained it to Peter and said, Look, I died for your New Testament, so that you could do what God had purposed at the beginning of the world, to have dominion on the earth. Right? The New Testament was given to Israel and, and Judah, so that they could have the law written in their hearts, so that they could, by the Holy Spirit, minister God's blessing to the nations. What a plan God has for the earth. Right? And so we have on our chart here Peter and the remnant, which is after Jesus died on the cross. I'll put Peter and the remnant of Israel because obviously the majority of Israel did not receive Jesus, but there was a few, just like all throughout Israel's history, there was always a remnant, a few people who were faithful to God, faithful to his instructions and revelations. So Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, the 12 uh, disciples, the apostles here, filled with the Holy Spirit, began to speak in languages that they did not know which was beginning the restoration process. We talked before about God's purpose to restore the earth to have dominion over it. Well, back in the beginning when God created Adam and Eve, they spoke the same language, right? Uh, I mean, men are from Mars, women from Venus, I know that, but I mean, the language they spoke, they could at least understand what to eat for dinner, right? All the people of the earth in Genesis 10 spoke the same language. But then in Genesis 11, when they created that false religion, remember the Tower of Babel? God confounded the language. Things were getting worse and worse. 
And here, at the beginning of the end, Peter says in Acts 2, 16, these are the last days. On your chart it says last days, it gives you a reference there. Peter said 2,000 years ago, he did not say, this is the beginning of a new thing called the church. He said, this is the last days that Joel, the prophet, talked about. And in these last days, God began to restore all things by giving the, the believing remnant of Israel the power to speak one language to all people, just like people did before the Tower of Babel. Amazing. And who had this privilege? Who had this blessed gift? God's chosen people. God's chosen people who are following the law, who came from the seed of David, who believed on the Messiah. They got this. They were going to be the ministers and priests to the other nations, speaking their language. Right? This is how God was going to restore his dominion on the earth. And so you have the last days there with the Holy Ghost-filled apostles speaking about the wrath to come, which, of course, the prophets warned about and John uh, uh, prophesied about. But now we're getting closer and closer to these end times here. We're getting closer and closer where, where they need to obey all that God had spoken since the world began, and the wrath is almost here. Let's look at Acts chapter 3, where Peter's preaching after the days of Pentecost. By the way, Pentecost was a Jewish feast day. And there's prophetic significance for Israel about that day. Uh, you're a Gentile, which means it has no meaning for you. Okay, but for Israel it meant something, and it meant what was going on in Acts 3 was the coming of the kingdom. It was the last days. Peter preaches in Acts 2 and 3 that this Jesus that you killed, you being Israel, that Israel killed and crucified, was the one the prophet spoke about. He says this is the one that came from Abraham, came from David, that's supposed to help us have dominion. He said, but you killed him. And so in, 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 Acts, uh, in Acts 3, turn back to Acts 2 real quick. So in Acts 2, verse 37, when the crowd at Pentecost heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? We killed our own Messiah. What do we do? And then Peter said unto them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. You shall receive the Holy Ghost. People think that's some new gospel for today, and it's not. You understand the progressive revelation of what God was doing, what's on your chart there, the progressive steps. Repentance was something the prophets were speaking about. Water baptism went as far back as the law, but John the Baptist made it a sign of his ministry. The name of Jesus Christ was important when Jesus came and said, Who am I? <laughs> well, you're the Son of God, or are you Elijah? We don't really know. His name was important. His authority. Okay, So whoever, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. How do they get remission of sins? They need to repent. Maybe you water baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, right? And then what? They'll receive the Holy Ghost. Why do they need that Holy Ghost for? Because God's going to work through them to restore all things, right? That's when he did that. We should have learned from the law. They can't do it on their own. They need a better testament. They need God's help. And so the Holy Ghost is going to help them through that, giving them the power and the protection to get into that kingdom, to have dominion, okay? Which, of course, was God's birth from the beginning. Look at Acts chapter 3, verse 19. Peter preaches another message after Pentecost here. And he says, Repent ye therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. And he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things, which God had spoken by the mouth of his holy prophets as the world began. And hopefully, we're at the point of your understanding what God spoke since the world began. Right? We've been talking about restoration. We said at the very beginning that God, ever since the fall, promised to restore man's dominion over the earth. And he chose to do it through a nation, with a covenant, through the Son of David, with a king, and, and water baptism and repentance, and Jesus is the Son of God. Okay, and so Peter here is preaching that. If you repent, he says, your sins may be blotted out. Over here, when he comes back in judgment and wrath, you won't be in the fire. You'll be preserved through it. You'll go into that kingdom. You'll be on the straight and narrow. Right? You won't be on the, the wide road to destruction, Peter preaches. So he says you need to do this. Because this is what God has spoken since the world began. If you look at uh, verse 22. For Moses truly said unto the fathers, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up. So Peter goes back and he quotes Moses and the fathers. In verse 24, it says, Yea, and all the prophets from Samuel and those that follow after, as many as have spoken, have likewise foretold of these days. So again, Peter's going back to the prophets, and he's going back saying, this was all spoken about before. If you would have read that Old Testament, instead of throwing it away, you would have known what was going on at Pentecost. You see? That's what Peter's saying in Acts 3, verse uh, 25 there. And so we have Peter preaching the last days, but as we progress through the book of Acts, we see some, some things happen. 
we see that as Peter and the twelve preach this message to Israel of repentance and to get on board with Jesus the Messiah, they don't. Okay? Yeah, there's a few thousand in Acts chapter 2, and there's a few thousand more later, but you know how big the nation of Israel was? It wasn't a few thousand. Uh, the majority rejected them. In fact, you had the rulers of Israel that would, would chase them down, bring them into the council, put them into prison, and attempted to kill them. Okay? And eventually they succeeded. And after 12, they, they killed one of the apostles. And after 7, Stephen, part of this believing remnant of Israel, filled with the Holy Ghost, his face shining like an angel, standing before the rulers in the council, explained to them what we just explained in the last 30 minutes about God's purpose since the world began. And he said, just like before, you're killing the prophets, you're killing God's messengers, and they stoned the guy. Let's look at Acts chapter 7, verse 58. This is the time the prophets spoke about and called Jacob's trouble. Why was it Jacob's trouble? This was the time that Jesus spoke about and said, there'll be a time where they'll deliver you up before councils and they'll scourge you and they'll beat you and they'll persecute you. And he says, if you endure to the end, you'll be saved, Mark 13, 13. Endure to the end of the what? All that trouble, all this persecution. And it started to happen. Okay, they were rejecting the message. They were facing persecution. That should have encouraged them to keep going. Acts 7, 50, 51 is where we'll start. Now, this is at the end of Stephen's uh, long sermon here about Israel's history about their constantly rejecting God's purpose. And he says, "Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you do always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did, so do ye. Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? And they have slain them which showed before of the coming of the just one, of whom ye have been now the betrayers and murderers. Stephen's blaming them for being the murderers of God's messengers sent before. Okay? They killed the prophets, they killed John, they killed Jesus, and now they're threatening Peter and the remnant. Right? You drop down to verse uh, 54. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart. It really hit home, right? And they gnashed on him with their teeth. They yelled at him. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven, saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God, which is confirmation, of course. He's the Son of God. And Stephen saw this. And behold, he said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. They cried out with a loud voice, stopped their ears, ran upon him with one accord, and cast him out of the city, and stoned him. So now they're, they're killing, as Jesus said in his earthly ministry, you can kill the prophets, you can even kill the Son and blaspheme him. But if you blaspheme the Holy Ghost, there's no more forgiveness for you. This was the unforgivable sin that Jesus taught about. They killed John the Baptist, they crucified Jesus, and here's Stephen filled with the Holy Ghost, face like an angel, and they stoned the guy. Okay? There's a change that happens here, as we'll see as we move through Acts. And so in Acts 7.58, it says they stoned him, and the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. Now, enter the picture, another person named Saul in Acts chapter 8, who leads the persecution against this kingdom remnant trying to have dominion over the earth. Acts 8.1, Saul was consenting unto his death, and at that time there was great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the region of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. The apostles stayed in Jerusalem. Okay? It's important to take people, when you're explaining to them God's revelations, through the book of Acts here. Uh, because Acts tells you what was going on as Israel rejected the message that God sent to them. Okay? The, the, the book of Acts is not about the success of the church. Acts ends with rejection. All throughout the book of Acts is rejection. It tells about uh, Peter and the Twelve going to Israel, and they rejected it. It talks about eventually Paul going to Israel, and they rejected him. In Acts 28, the last thing in the book, you have Paul going to the Jews in Rome. That's way far away from Jerusalem, and even they reject him. So he's gone to the ends of the earth, and they've all rejected God's message. Okay, and this is the point of the book of Acts. But if you look at Acts chapter 9, verse 1, we see this Saul again, the one who was there at the stoning of Stephen, the one who rejected Jesus Christ, one who was not with Peter, agreeing that he was the Son of God, in fact, he was breathing threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord in Acts 9, verse 1. So he went to the high priest. He demanded letters that he can go chase after these people and kill them and, and get rid of this sect, right? this, this, uh, this unrighteous heretic. And so in Acts 9, we read about the conversion of Saul, where the Lord Jesus Christ comes back to this murdering sinner. Okay, He was a murdering sinner because he killed John the Baptist and Jesus. He was consenting to the death of Stephen. He was against God's purposes. Right? Yes, he was a Jew, but like Jews today, he rejected the Messiah. Okay? And so there's no reason the Lord would come back and say, I'm going to bless you. 
But that's what he did exactly. He came back and said, I'm appearing to you and not coming back to burn you up. I'm not coming back to destroy you. I'm coming back to save you, to tell you I've chosen you as a vessel to preach. Whoa. He was unsaved. He was a sinner. Just like Paul says in Romans 5.18, or 5.8 rather, it was why we were yet sinners Christ died for us. And so to Paul, God gives a message that was heretofore not known. And then you read through the book of Acts and you read uh, Paul's epistles, you start learning that Paul has something kept secret. So this is where, if you look at your chart, what we have on the board, the same thing you have, which is God's prophetic purpose from the beginning to the end. But we're at the point of this crease right here where before the end came, something else happened in your Bible. And you learn about the conversion of Paul, which really wouldn't have been that significant except God gave him instructions that differed from all the other instructions. You say, well, how do you know that, Justin? Well, let's read some of Paul's writings. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 7, for example, where Paul says that he has the hidden wisdom of God, which, you know, everybody else had some wisdom from God too. God revealed to Moses and to David. But 1 Corinthians 2, verse 7, he says, We speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom, which God ordained before the world unto our glory. Peter said, I'm preaching everything since the world began. Paul says, I got stuff way over here, way, way this side of the world's creation. So on your chart, at the very top, you see the yellow. Way before the earth was created, you have the hidden wisdom of God in a mystery. In 1 Corinthians 2, verse 7. You read in Romans 16, 25. Turn to the left one page in your Bible. Romans 16, 25. Paul says, Now the hand that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began. So this is a direct contrast to what Peter said at Pentecost. Paul says, since the world began, what I'm saying was a secret. Peter says, what I'm saying at Pentecost was not a secret. You should have known this. So apparently there's something different here. Okay? And Paul's saying it's now being revealed. Whereas it was kept secret before, unknown to anyone on the earth, Jew or Gentile, it's now being revealed. It's being made known. See this bright yellow light in your chart here where it's made known to people through the Apostle Paul. Acts 9.15, God says to Paul, you're my chosen vessel to take my message and to suffer for me to Israel, to the Gentiles, and the kings of the earth. For the first time in the history of the planet, God has chosen someone to go preach a message of salvation to Gentiles, to everybody. And you know what? The kingdom hasn't come yet. The wrath didn't come. And he's doing it with some very distinct doctrines that are different than what he promised to Israel, David, and John the Baptist in, his, in, in the remnant. Okay? I have in your outline there uh, some red words, or so, your chart, some red words. You see these red dots that connect Jesus over here before the cross to Paul after the cross. In Romans chapter 15, verse 8, this is a very good verse comparison to show people. Because in Romans 15, Paul explains this transition, this difference between his ministry and in the ministry of Jesus according to prophecy. Romans 15, 8 says, Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises made to the fathers, which would be what exactly? Promises made to the fathers was to have dominion on the earth, right? Jesus Christ came confirming that purpose. Verse 9, if we want to read on, it says that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. What was the goal of God for the earth? That the Gentiles would be blessed through Israel's glory. Jesus Christ, of course, being the king. Right? Romans 15, 8 and 9. Drop down to verse 16. Romans 15, 16. Now we're going to read the red words here given to Paul when he says that Jesus Christ, that God gave him grace in verse 15, that I should be the minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles. Ministering the gospel of God, the offering up of the Gentiles might be acceptable. And so he's going to Gentiles with a message of grace and salvation that he says in Romans 16 was kept secret since the world began. So now we're getting some information about how what Paul was given to do is very different than what God gave to Israel. Okay, We can read down through our chart here. What we do on our board is make an interruption here. And we're going to put in that interruption some new information from God as we're making our timeline. This new information is the mystery. Okay? And of course, it was hidden before the world began. The mystery revealed, the, the front of your chart has that as its title, the revealing of the mystery, which is what this, this fold-out is supposed to do, to show you what's in the Bible, and then voila, look at that. There's something revealed to Paul, it's supposed to emphasize that revelation, only because that revelation speaks directly to us today. Okay, It speaks to knowing our, knowing our audience. 
To Paul was given the preaching of the cross. To Paul was given the meaning of what Christ did at Calvary. Look at Colossians chapter 1, verse 26. There was a difference between the event of the cross, or what happened at Calvary, and what happened by Calvary. What happened at Calvary, the disciples didn't know about. You know, when it did happen, they just knew that it happened, right? But there was no one at the cross, there was no one at his resurrection saying, salvation to everybody. They weren't saying that. It wasn't until Paul that it was revealed what happened by the cross. By that cross, forgiveness can come to all men. By that cross, salvation can be offered to you freely. By that cross, you can have eternal life without works. By that cross, you get imputed righteousness. Okay, none of these things were understood by the cross before. Righteousness before came through covenants and promises. Forgiveness came through their repentance and baptism in the name of Jesus Christ. Okay, But there's nothing in there about by the cross. Paul preaches by the cross. How are Gentiles blessed according to God's earthly program? Through Israel. By covenants, by promises, by fulfillment of prophecy, by God's commitment to do what he said he would do. But how are you blessed today through the revelation of the mystery? By the cross, folks. By what Christ already accomplished for you. He did it for you by grace while you didn't even know anything about it. While you rejected him, while you were a sinner. God provided a, a, a plan of salvation and revealed it so that we can preach it today and see men saved. Okay? We read in Colossians chapter 1, verse 26, that Paul was given... A mystery to Gentiles. Okay, if you back up to verse 25, he says, I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God given to me for you. So a dispensation is just God dispensing, giving something out. And he says he's giving out to the Colossians. They were Gentiles. Ephesians 3, 2, he says, Have you heard of the dispensation of the grace of God given to me, to you Gentiles? Not many people have heard of it. But Paul's revealing it here. And so he says in verse 20. Six, it's even the mystery which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints. And in Colossians 1, 26. So we see in our timeline, it was hidden from these people, but now it's revealed. Now it's made known. You see, it's important when we study our Bible. Who is speaking? To whom are they speaking? Where do we fit? What's our instructions? Well, you would be Gentiles, and in today's time, which is before the kingdom comes, before God's fulfillment of prophecy, you got this glorious message of the mystery here that we're supposed to understand. Paul says we're to be stewards of the mysteries. 1 Corinthians 4, verse 2. All right, look at Colossians 1, 27. The mystery he explains here is that God would make known the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles. Now, it was no secret that God sought for glory on the earth through Israel, through the king of Israel, through a nation. But it was a secret that God was providing the riches of glory to Gentiles whom he never dealt with, who were far away from him. Okay, And so Colossians 1, 27, the riches of glory among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. It's not just Christ ruling over you. It's not just Christ among you, God dwelling with them. This is Christ in you. This is Christ dying for your sins to make you forgiven so that he can work through you as a new creature, the body of Christ. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Behold, all things are become new. On the bottom of the, the, the mystery section, you have that quote, Behold, all things are become new, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. And it's got listed there, a new dispensation. I emphasize this more than the others because this is for your participation. There was a new revelation given to Paul. Just like there was a new one given to Jesus and David and, and the law. And there was a new one given to Paul. A new dispensation. A new gospel was given to him. The gospel is no longer, hey, the kingdom's almost here. The gospel is now the preaching of the cross. And so Paul emphasizes why Christ had to die. And it's by that cross that everything you, you need depends upon. Okay, salvation, forgiveness, righteousness. If Christ di didn't accomplish it, you can't do it. And the good news is he did it. He accomplished everything on your behalf. And so there's a new gospel. There's a new apostle, of course. Everyone tries to follow the pattern of the 12 apostles. Of course, they were 12 because there were 12 tribes in Israel, right? That's why there's 12 doors in this kingdom, because 12 tribes have to enter in. People try to follow the pattern of the 12 instead of the pattern of the one new apostle that God gave to the one new creature of the body of Christ, making Jew and Gentile one new man. Okay? There's a new apostle, there's a new purpose, which is strange enough. 
In Israel's program on the earth, their purpose was to be that example to the world, to by their obedience to God's covenant and their good works, the world would see a pattern, an example of how to be good. And of course, Christ would reign over them, and the Holy Ghost would provide them that ability. Right? Now today, your message is not, look how good I can be. That's not your message. As the Pope wrongly said, if that's the only message the church has, we don't know the revelation of the mystery. Then that's vanity, folks, because nobody can be good enough. Right? In fact, Jesus was the only one that was sinless in history, and he's gone now. Right? They say, well, that's Jesus working in you. Well, nobody can be perfect. Right? Uh, we're very bad examples of that. But the message today is of grace. That doesn't mean sin is okay. We shouldn't sin, God forbid. And yet we present that Christ died for everyone. Look at me. Look at you. Look at that guy. Look what he did. God died for everybody. Right? And we can be saved by what he did. That's God's grace. So there's a new purpose of us preaching grace, not preaching the law, not preaching a kingdom on the earth. There's also a new destiny. Paul says in Ephesians 1 verse 3 that he's given us all spiritual blessings in heavenly places, which is in contrast to Peter saying, you're going to get forgiveness at the restitution of all things when Jesus comes back to the earth. Paul says you have all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. Paul says in Philippians 3 verse 20, our conversation is in heaven. Ephesians 2, verse 6, Paul says he sit you, he, you're sitting with Christ in heavenly places. You have a position reserved for you in heaven. Right? Nobody since the beginning of the world had ever thought about going to heaven. It was always about dominion on the earth. Yet Paul says you're going to heaven. Okay? So instead of earthly dominion down here, we have heaven and heavenly dominion. See the contrast. Of course, you have all these teachings on your chart right for you with the, with the references that are contrasted to what Paul, how God was operating through, through Israel. Okay? So when you explain the chart to someone, it's important that you contrast what was given to Paul, what was given to Israel. It's conveniently given to you uh, on the same layer on your chart, so that if you want to, instead of explaining an hour long this whole dispensational chart, you can just do one layer. This is very simple to do, it takes a few minutes. You can just talk about Moses. Moses was given the law, it was given to Israel, Exodus 19.14, it says right there, and yet Paul says, you're not under the law, Romans 6.14. That's the difference, right? What's going on? So Paul, if anything, negates what God said to Moses. You can't do them both. You can't not be under the law and be under the law at the same time. There's got to be something happening there, and that's what this chart uh, serves the purpose of. You can start with David's throne. You can start with the prophets. John the Baptist water baptism, or John the Baptist water baptized, so that there would be a kingdom of priests, which it was required to be baptized as priests to enter the kingdom. Paul says, Christ sent me not to baptize. Okay? And so we have these, uh, these verses on your chart here that help explain these things. Uh, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 9, 17, a dispensation of the gospel was committed unto me to, have, uh, to create a new creature that would reside in heavenly places. And so look at Ephesians chapter 1, verse 9. It is not that God has forgotten the promises he made to Israel. It's not that God has cast away the earth so that God is now only concerned with spirituality and invisible things. Even though it's true he, he's concerned with spiritual things today. But he will at one time in the future. He will after this time is over. Okay, He will restore all things on the earth. And yet at this time God has revealed a mystery about what he's doing. And it's changed our understanding of his will. And it's changed the way we respond to him. Okay? We'd be wrong to try to respond to him according to old revelations or according to things he's doing in the future when that's not what he's doing today. Right? That's called right division. But I told you to turn to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 9, where this will help us understand a little bit God's will when people are floundering around trying to discover God's will for their life or they think God's will is for them to be a part of a kingdom somewhere and to build up a nation. And rather, Paul says in Ephesians 1, 9, that God has made known unto us the mystery of his will. So it's something that we should understand if we study the Bible, rightly divided, according to his good pleasure, which he had purposed in himself. <coughs> Part of this mystery of God's will is revealed to Paul. Because before, all that we knew about God's will is that he was operating to develop an earthly kingdom, an earthly nation, to bless the, the Gentiles through Israel. And yet Paul says, we have obtained an inheritance, or I skipped a verse, didn't I? Verse 10 that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. And so what we have is that the restoration that God had promised since the world began, when God would restore dominion on the earth, 
dominion on the earth was not all that God had in mind. God also wanted to have dominion in heaven. And yet we knew nothing about heaven since the world began. And yet he revealed to Paul how that by the cross, God has now provided the means to have dominion over earth and heaven. So Ephesians 1 verse 10 says, In the fullness of times, his will is accomplished that all things, heaven and earth, we brought together in Christ. Okay, this is the mystery of his will. Now that we understand that, we can understand that there's a purpose God had for heaven and a purpose he had for earth. And when we read the Bible, we need to make the, understand the difference between the two. We need to discern that they are separate. Okay? Which again, this chart should help you understand that. We're now living in the time of God's mystery revelation. It's no longer a mystery. It has been revealed. We just need to study it in the scriptures. Okay? Paul talked about it. We're not living in the time of God's prophetic purpose, even though we can learn from prophecy and learn about God's character and learn what he will do and his purpose to restore things on the earth. Those aren't written for our particip participation, right? So those are things that we would call prophecy. Things and doctrines we need to learn now, how we respond to God is according to the mystery of Christ given to Paul. And then we'll, we'll finally understand uh, God's complete uh, purpose and plan for the ages. Okay? Uh, we must rightly divide the Bible. Uh, we must rightly divide what God said to Israel from what he said to the church. You must rightly divide the heaven and his heavenly purpose, we'll call the church going up to heaven up here, and his earthly purpose, having dominion over the earth and the nations. We must rightly divide the gospel of prophecy and what was good news to these people and what was good news to us, okay? Because they're different. It would have been good news to us if the kingdom came and things happened like the prophecy said. That would have been good news to Gentiles as well. But what's better news is that you have a higher position in Christ now above all things, complete in him, without a covenant, without a kingdom. you got it right now freely, okay? That's even better news. And so that was revealed as part of the mystery, and we need to be able to rightly divide when that, when that was revealed. And, and not to divide the doctrines that aren't for us. It'll affect the way we live, and it affects the way we understand the Bible. Okay. Hopefully this chart is a useful tool for you to uh, explain some of these things. Uh, that was just to go through the whole chart, and of course I left out a lot of verses, and didn't go through everything in order. There's a lot of information on here. There's a lot of stuff on here that's, that's left off. <laughs> uh, I had to consciously try to leave things off so that there'd be some, some blank space for your eyes to rest. Um, so it makes sense. But... Uh, this is just the beginning. It's supposed to help people understand how to begin to start to rightly divide their Bible. Okay? Like I said, some things you can compare is just uh, in the bold letters here, the prophecy and the mystery. You can just take one step and go through time in the Bible and how the, God's instructions change to show someone the difference. Okay? Um, you can use the books in the bottom of the chart here to show where in the Bible they can find some misinformation. Okay? So all these are useful. And, of course, some of the principles I discussed today are printed on the back two panels teaching how to rightly divide and, and how to know your instructions. Okay, uh, This lesson will be online along with the chart and, and the video, so you can go back and, and reference it.